I'm excited to have with us today Dara Goldstein, the Adsit Professor of Russian at Williams College and the founding editor of the James Beard award-winning food journal, Gastronomica. Dara is a prolific writer and consultant on culinary and cultural topics. She has done everything from organizing a historical exhibition of tableware at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum to serving as a national spokesperson for Stolichnaya Vodka when it first came to the United States. Best of all, Dara is also my aunt. <laughs> she is the author of five well-known cookbooks and is here today to discuss her latest, Fire and Ice, Classic Nordic Cooking, just released by 10 Speed Press. I'm pleased to welcome Dara Goldstein to Google Today. Thank you so much, Annie. And uh, Annie's husband, Jacob, is here, uh, my nephew. So this is a really meaningful place for me to be because I feel very, I mean, I know all of you always feel connected, but I, I feel connected in a very personal way. Uh, so thank you for having me. I want to talk to you, I don't know how many of you have traveled throughout Scandinavia or are familiar with it, but it's a place that's been very uh, close to my heart for a long time. Um, way back in college, I was studying Russian, and I wanted to go to the Soviet Union, obviously, to become a better Russian speaker, but that was back in the Cold War days, long before you were born. Well, I guess we're back into the new Cold War now, so I, I uh, shouldn't make it so historical. But it was impossible for me to get a visa. So I thought, where can I possibly go where I could perhaps go in as a tourist and still experience Soviet life? So I decided to go to um, Helsinki because it is a cold, dark, northerly place, and I could easily get across the border to what was then Leningrad. And I studied at the University of Helsinki, and it just opened my eyes to so many things, and importantly for this book, to so many flavors. Fast forward eight years, I was newly married, once again, wanting to go to the Soviet Union. I mean, something might have been wrong with me, but it was a place that was very compelling. I was studying right up the road here at Stanford. And my husband and I had given up everything and decided to get married so that we could go to the Soviet Union together. And uh, we gave up our teaching assistantships, our apartment, and applied for the visas. That was 1980 and uh, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. The US pulled out of the Olympics, and my visa with the last name of Goldstein was revoked. And his, his last name is Crawford. He got a visa, but he's not a Russianist. So once again, we're in this position of what do we do? So I thought it has to be another cold, dark place not too far from Soviet Union. So we went to Stockholm and spent the year in Stockholm. And again, that was just eye-opening. It was really wonderful. And I realized that I was in love with the Nordic countries. So if you look at this map, you can see that it stretches really from Denmark up to, it, it's cut off at the top because you are present, I am presenting to everyone. <laughs> so you can't really see the full length, but it's about 2,000 uh, kilometers from south to north. The, Climate here is fairly mild in northerly terms. And down here in uh, Sweden, this area, Småland, is considered the Tuscany of Sweden because the temperature is uh, so temperate, shall we say. But the part that intrigues me is up here, the far north, up above the Arctic Circle. And here, uh, that's cut off a bit, is the Barents Sea which is shared by both Russia and Norway. Norway goes all the way up. And if you look at these countries, you can see that what really defines them all is very long coastlines. When I was thinking about this book and so many years of having traveled to this region, I thought, uh, 
what interests me most, most, and it's this idea of a northern dimension, a northern way of thinking that really has nothing to do with political boundaries. It has to do with how people have survived over the centuries in what is largely a very inhospitable climate. So I wanted to look at the whole sweep of foods and the way of thinking. Now, one of the interesting things about studying this region is you find all sorts of uh, quirky things that have happened. For instance, up here, you can't quite see uh, the border of Norway with, the, uh, with Russia is right there. But in the 1960s, the Soviet scientists decided that they wanted to put the Kamchatka crab, which is like a huge king crab. I mean, if its uh, claws are extended, it, it's really much taller than I am, actually, if you were to put it on end. And they decide to put it into the Barents Sea because it, it um, is from the Far East because they wanted to start farming it. And that very smart crab in the 1960s wanted to escape from the Soviet Union and cross the waters into Norway where it uh, found very rich, uh, fertile feeding grounds in the Barents Sea and became a real ecological problem that they're still contending with. Conversely, in Finland, this area, you can see Finland has many, many lakes. And here's the border with Russia, somewhat artificial border, I might add. But uh, there's a very wonderful fish called the vendis, which is a little bit like a smelt, called muiku in Finnish. And that uh, fish in Finnish they refer to as the wise old man of the lake because even though it's very close to Lake Ladoga and there are connections, it never crosses the border into Russia. It stays in Finland. Anyway, so this gives you a sense of the topography of the place. So I was thinking about what to call this book, and I decided I wanted to do Fire and Ice, because to me, those are really the two poles of what the Nordic countries are about. And um, my publishers at 10 Speed, who are just up the road and across the bay in Emeryville, loved the title but thought, well, is that going to compete too much with Song of Ice and Fire, you know, Game of Fro Thrones? You have to have something you can Google, and it'll come right up, and everyone's going to be finding Game of Thrones. But um, they luckily were very, in the end, uh, amenable to this topic and came up with this quite beautiful cover, I think. If you hold it up to the light, you'll see that it is very shimmery and iridescent, which to me captures that uh, quality of light that you find in the far north and the iridescence of ice. So when I talk about these two poles of fire and ice, the dish that comes most to mind is a dish from the Sami, who are uh, also known as Laplanders. They live in the far north of Norway, Sweden, and also Finland. And historically, they were nomads. And uh, you know, like many people in modern life, they're much more settled. But they're still allowed to herd their reindeer. And in the winter time, they would take chunks of the reindeer meat, because reindeer was a, a very important means of uh, economic life, but also uh, uh, nourishment for them. And they would take the reindeer meat, bury it in the snow, and then take a very sharp hunting knife and shave it off in, in quite thin slivers. And you can see the snow all around here. And then they would light a fire, and these crystalline pieces of shaved reindeer that still had the ice on them would go into a skillet and then it would steam because the water would evaporate as it was cooking. I tried so hard to get reindeer as I was testing this book because this is one of my absolute favorite dishes in the world. I couldn't find a source of reindeer. We happen to have a lot of venison, so my version is with venison. But it's something you can, if you have a strong husband, I would say, who has a hunting knife, um, it's very easy to do at home. But this uh, fire and ice theme continues also 
in uh, the beverages that are found in the northern countries. The one on the left is glug, which you find particularly in uh, Sweden and also in Denmark. And basically, it's a mulled wine. And if you think about this climate and how dark it gets, so when I was living in Finland, uh, the sun would sort of come up around 10 in the morning at the darkest part of the year and sort of set at 3 o'clock. So you had five hours, but it was only quasi-daylight. You know, it wasn't this California sun that is bright and a blue sky. Everything was sort of gray. And so one of the things that the Scandinavians do is to bring light into their lives and uh, have things like this golden mulled wine with all kinds of spices I'll talk about in a minute. The ice uh, counterpart to that is aquavit, or schnapps, which is basically a distilled alcohol, generally made from grain, uh, but it's usually flavored with dill. Uh, aquavit generally with caraway is the most classic flavor. I made some with tiny new birch leaves that I had picked that give it a very bitter taste that the Scandinavians tend to love. Or around Christmas time, I really like to use cardamom and ginger for these warming flavors. So you can here you see there's rosemary, which surprisingly grows quite well uh, in the very long summers. But you can flavor it with everything. And I won't go into my Stoli Girl spiel about all the different flavors you can make, but it's a lot of fun to experiment. But it's served ice cold. Uh, this is a photograph from a village called Longyearbyen in the Svalbard archipelago, which is up uh, about halfway between the northern tip of Norway and the North Pole. So it is really far north. And I love this photograph because for me it captures this whole idea of the fire and the ice. When it's dark, but when there's ice on the ground, there's a kind of glow. And in the homes, there are candles, there's this beautiful light, and it's a way of bringing warmth into your environment when the external environment is not so friendly. There's a beautiful word in Danish called hygge, and it doesn't really translate into English, but it's something like comfort. And uh, it's not the kind of comfort if you get under your comforter in bed all by yourself. It's the kind of comfort where there's camaraderie and you have some glug and you're drinking together and sharing things. And actually the Old Norse root of hygge and hug are the same. So you can see where that comes from. So I don't know if you find this kind of landscape as beautiful as I do, but this Svalbard archipelago is actually a very important place because it, it is home to the uh, Global Seed Bank, which is also known as the Doomsday Vault. And it was conceived in 2006, finally finished in 2008. And the seeds from all over the world are deposited there as a, a guard uh, for biodiversity in case there are crop failures or, as is happening now in Syria, you know, a terrible war raging. And when the seed bank in Syria had to move to, from Aleppo to Beirut, they had to leave a lot of their seeds behind. So they had deposited seeds in this doomsday vault. And uh, each country is only allowed to get its own seeds, so it, you can't take other people's seeds and start planting them. But they were able to retrieve some. This building was built again to capture that light. It has uh, stainless steel, mirrored surfaces, these wonderful reflections. And if you can also think of the northern lights, you get a bit of a sense of that in that greenishness there. It's really gorgeous. The seeds are kept at uh, minus 18 degrees Celsius, and they believe that they'll remain viable for uh, a good 200 years. So now to move more specifically to food. Probably the two most uh, common uh, Swedish loan words in English are dynamite, <laughs> which was introduced by Alfred Nobel. And of course, Nobel's a very uh, familiar fa um, name to us, particularly this time of year. And smorgasbord. So this is a, a very classic Swedish smorgasbord. 
And where does it come from? Well, in the past, particularly uh, I'm talking around the 16th century, it was called a Brenvins board, which is really more like a schnapps or aquavit table that focused mainly on the alcohol. And gradually, more and more food was introduced until by uh, the 19th century, and then particularly in the 1960s, there was a very famous restaurateur in Stockholm who sort of institutionalized this smorgasbord as we tend to know it today. The name itself is a, a compound uh, noun that comes from three different words, smur, which means butter, goose, which means goose, and board, which means table. The smurgos was actually a term that came from churning butter. I don't know if any of you have ever churned butter by hand. You've probably inadvertently made butter if you've whipped cream for too long and suddenly you have butter. But you're churning and churning, and these clumps of butter start forming on the surface. And they looked a bit like dancing geese. So those became the smurgos, which became itself a metonym a metonymy for sandwich, and then the sandwich table became the smorgasbord. Now in Sweden, what you do with that is you have five different, they call them tours. You take five different tours. It's five different helpings. And first, always first, is His Majesty the Herring. And the first round of filling your plate is always many different kinds of herring in all different forms. Pickled, creamed, smoked, uh, chopped, all beautiful things. Then comes the servings of uh, different kinds of fish and shellfish. Because remember, as I mentioned, there's a lot of coastline, so fish is a very important part of the diet. Next come the cold meat and salads. And then uh, the hot dishes, so you might think Swedish meatballs or stuffed cabbage leaves or uh, all kinds of um, veal dishes. And then the final one, of course, has to be the sweet one. And with all of them, you have schnapps, because that's a very important part of the experience. So we have this beautiful institution of smorgasbord, which is a very Swedish thing. And uh, it came into the United States in 1939 at the New York World's Fair in the Swedish Pavilion and became all the rage. Unfortunately, it has devolved into the sort of all-you-can-eat buffet. Um, there's this great map of the United States that I like to show my students that shows all of the states and their distinctive foods. And Utah, oh no, sorry, ne sorry, Utah, Nevada, you know where Las Vegas is, has a uh, chafing dish from the all-you-can-eat buffets there. But its translation is even stranger in Japanese culture. Uh, the word smorgasbord doesn't uh, lend itself easily to pronunciation in Japanese. So what happened in 1958 at the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo is that uh, the owner saw the 1958 film The Vikings with Kirk Douglas. It was narrated by Orson Welles and was totally enthralled you know, with these Vikings. And so he decided to call the buffet that they were presenting Viking, Viking, and that has become the word for buffet in Japanese. This is a modern ad for, I can't read the Japanese, I don't know if anyone in the room can, but um, it's for the Japanese buffet. But let's get back to the food. So thinking again about this very cold climate, uh, the only grains that thrived there were barley and spelt to some degree and oats. And then uh, a little bit later on, rye came in from Russia. But wheat really was not grown because the climate was too cold, and it didn't enter too much into the cuisine until the late 19th century, when it was already being milled and it was affordable in the form of flour. And that's when there was this explosion of wonderful baked goods that uh, we can talk about if you have questions at the end. But most of the breads are still based uh, primarily on rye, but also uh, to some degree barley flour and also oats. So they're very, very uh, wholesome, very hearty, whole grain. They also eat all of these things as porridge. 
Finland in particular has the most extraordinarily diverse array of breads that I've encountered anywhere. There's still probably something like a hundred that are being commercially produced. And if you draw a line down the middle of Finland, basically you encounter the two traditions. To the east, which is um, towards Russia, you find these breads like this one, uh, big sourdough loaves that have been baked in masonry ovens. They're very uh, thick and uh, savory and chewy. In the western part of Finland, unbelievably, they bake their breads only once or twice a year. They didn't have as much fuel, and so wood was very expensive for the ovens. And what they did was uh, make these thinner loaves. They were much flatter. And they had holes in the center, as you see here. And they would put them on poles that would be hung up in the rafters of the house. And it would dry and become a kind of hardtack. Sometimes it became so hard that then you had to uh, shave it again with that handy hunting knife, or soak it, or put it in soup. So the people mostly like the sort of standard yeasted loaf that we know today. But there's also an amazing tradition throughout all of the Nordic countries for the flatbreads, the crisp breads, which are really crackers. And one of my favorite recipes in the book, which I think is just awesome because I've never really encountered a recipe like it before, is you take some uh, preservative-free rye bread or multigrain bread, and you soak it overnight in beer or ale. And then in the morning, you squeeze it out, so you just have this paste, add a tiny bit of soft butter, and spread it really thin on uh, some parchment paper, bake it, and you have this extraordinarily healthy cracker. And uh, you can change the flavor all the time, depending which bread you use. Uh, we tend to think of the far north as just barren. Uh, I don't know if any of you know Gary Paul Nabin's writings, but he's written a beautiful book about the desert, which we also, also think of as a barren place. But the Native Americans who lived there knew how to eat from the desert. And the people who lived from, in the far north knew how to eat from the land and from the sea. And one of the incredible riches from the north is mushrooms. We tend to think of foraging as a very chic activity. And we go out and we collect mushrooms. And we feel good about ourselves, as we should. Uh, and we commune with nature. But there, it's something that is built into the genes. It is something that is absolutely necessary. So here we have some black trumpets. The most favorite mushroom, I would say, is the chanterelle. And, the, and they're just golden. I mean, it's like finding gold in the woods. And they're so very beautiful. And um, people go out, and they won't really tell where their mushroom spots are, because they want to be able to return to them over and over. The other thing that the northern woods provide are things that we don't really use so much. Uh, juniper berries, which grow, I mean, juniper grows in northern California. Fir trees and spruce trees grow. And uh, everything, again, this whole uh, conversation we have about eating locally, eating seasonally, it really is the way of life for people in the Nordic countries, because it's how they survived. So in the spring, you can go out and get these very beautiful young shoots of the fir, the spruce trees. You don't want them to uh, mature too much, because then they'll get really too strong. But they have this beautiful resinous. If you think about Retsina, the Greek wine, if any of you like that sort of piney flavor, that's what you get. And you can mix it with butter. You can infuse oil with it. If you're making gravlax, which I'll get to shortly, you can add it uh, with the dill to layer it. And it adds this wonderful flavor. How many of you know juniper berries? <laughs> Intimately, OK, good. <laughs> so you dry these berries, and they add, I don't know, to me, it's just the taste of the wild. You, again, can pound them in a mortar and pestle, or you can use the food processors, OK, too. But I really like to get that aroma coming up from the pestle right there and not have it um, enclosed. 
Uh, you can add that to butter, put it on some rye bread, and it's just amazing. Add it to stews. There's a wonderful recipe for an apple soup that your guests will have no idea what you're serving them. They won't be able to detect what it is, but it's basically pureed apples with some apple cider and some juniper berries. It's really quick and beautiful, but it has this sort of wild element. But I think what uh, Scandinavia is perhaps most renowned for are the berries. And we have all of the berries that uh, we're familiar with here, but also some really distinctive, very special ones. Um, on the left, you have cloud berries, which are very fleeting. They ripen in the end of August, and they grow in bogs. And what you'll see uh, if you're driving on the roads in the northern part of uh, Finland, Sweden, and Norway, they don't really grow in Denmark, is people in full, um, they're like beekeepers because they're covered head to toe, but they're protecting themselves against the mosquitoes, <laughs> which are really vicious. But they want, the foragers want the cloudberries so much that it's worth it. And they have this wonderfully musky flavor. And uh, they also have a lot of vitamin A, vitamin C, surprisingly a lot of iron, which you don't usually think of with berries, and omega-3 and 6 fats. So they're sort of a superfood. And they're made into jam. Uh, and also, Finland makes a really nice liqueur. The, on the right, you see sea buckthorn, which grows uh, more, uh, more to the south on the coastline. I like to think of the sea buckthorn as the Linus Pauling of berries, because it has so much vitamin C. And in Russia, I know they're uh, using it as a, um, a, a cancer drug. Um, the jury's still out how effective it is. But it's very, very tart. I mean, it's really puckery. And it's made into a juice and also into a jam. So the number of berries in Finland alone that are edible, there are something like 50. So I think you see familiar ones here, like raspberries, um, green and pink gooseberries. Uh, there are red currants here. And up at the top, the red ones are rowan berries, and you can see lingon berries, uh, bilberries, and blueberries. My favorite is lingon berry. The lingon berry grows in Canada. It doesn't grow in the United States. If you go to IKEA, you can get it in a jar. And it's still quite wonderful, but the amazing thing about them is that they have a natural benzoic acid so much that you don't have to cook them to make a jam. You just stir them with sugar, because you really do need sugar. They're very, very tart. Mm. And I'm starting to <laughs> sort of salivate as I think about their tartness, uh, just that puckeriness. But you just stir them with the sugar, and they don't spoil. So in the middle of winter, you open up this jar of lingonberries, and you feel like the summer has come again, and it gets you through that long, dark season. But I want to get back to the Vikings. <laughs> so here's Kirk Douglas in 1958 in the Vikings. And I think the only reason he doesn't have a beard is because you know he has that cleft chin, and he always had to show that off. Um, he does have that glass eye that is just totally weird. But um, you also have the guys from the, the current hit series, The Vikings, who are very bearded. And I'm looking around the room here. I do see one beard. <laughs> Did you just move here from Brooklyn? No. no? OK. <laughs> so you go to Brooklyn, and everyone is fermenting food, and everyone, oh, no, I see two beards. Oh, wow. Did you just move here? No. no? OK. All right. Well. Um, and all the men have these Viking-style beards. Uh, the reason I'm bringing it up is uh, simply because the Vikings did live in this part of the world. But there is this company in Iceland that is making uh, all kinds of products for beards that they advertise by saying, we're tapping into more than a 1,000 years of beard-carrying tradition from a culture that uh, grows beards that had to handle the frost, snow, wind, dirt, and sea that comes with living in some of the most demanding places nature has to offer. We do this uh, so you and your beard 
can stand strong in the face of nature and proudly say, show me what you got, I can take it. Now, what does this have to do with a cookbook on Nordic food? Well, if you delve into their website, you find that all of their products are absolutely natural, and they are the foods that are still being eaten in the Nordic lands today. So juniper berries, which I mentioned, bog myrtle, which is also known as sweet gale, and it was used, it, uh, its leaves are somewhat resinous, resin, resinous but it was also used to uh, replace hops and used to make ale. Dill, which is the most iconic of the herbs in Scandinavian cooking, comes from the word to comfort. One of my favorite, it's all about comfort for me. Yarrow, rosemary, rapeseed oil, which is none other than canola oil, which is actually a, a GMO uh, product. Pine, and then down at the bottom, there's beeswax. So um, these Vikings were very important. We tend to think of them as predators and plunderers, which I guess they were. We also tend to think of them as having uh, traveled west towards England and the Faroe Islands and Ireland and then on to Vinland, which uh, Newfoundland and Canada. But what uh, most of us don't really think about is that they also went south and east. And you can see that they went as far as uh, the Black Sea and also the Caspian. And what happened there, particularly in Constantinople, is they connected with the great trade routes, the Silk Road, and all of these spices coming in from the east. And they brought them back to Scandinavia. So if you think on the one hand about the, uh, the bog myrtle and the juniper and the spruce growing there, you also have these extraordinary spices that came in fairly early. And the uh, Scandinavians, particularly the Swedes and the Danes, adopted them and they became uh, the uh, basis for baking and also for some savory foods like the glug. These are glug spices that you see here. So you have ginger, you have cardamom, which is the single most important, along with cinnamon, the two single most important spices used in baking. There's also nutmeg, cloves, uh, star anise, and uh, the vanilla that came later, the oranges came somewhat later. But they're all really, really important to um, the aroma of the Nordic cooking. And at Christmas time, in every uh, Nordic country, you have some form of gingerbread known as pepperkakor, or, you know, in it, its various iterations, gingerbread cookies. So it's, um, we think of gingerbread men and women, but in Europe, they actually made the gingerbread in the form of animals. And there was a reason for this anthropomorphism. If you think about living in cold, dark, scary places that have impenetrable pine forests and there are bears and uh, elk and wolves and all of these creatures that you know really are a bit terrifying if they're not uh, disnified. If you eat those creatures symbolically, you diminish their power in a certain way because you are ingesting them, but you also take on some of the attributes of strength. So these are modern gingerbread cookies. Um, so that's why you see the Moomin Trolls, <laughs> which are a 20th century phenomenon. Uh, Tove Janssen, who's a Finnish writer and does stories about these cute trolls. Uh, the kitty cat isn't really too terrifying, <laughs> unless you have a cat like I once did. But um, the, the gingerbread is a very important part of it. So it's not just foods from the earth. It's also these spices that came in, including saffron. And one of the most important uh, foods in Sweden are the Lucia buns, which are baked every December 13th. December 13th used to be the longest night of the year, the shortest day of the year, the darkest moment when all of the evil spirits would come out. And they were named after uh, Santa Lucia, uh, who uh, gave up uh, her eyes because she didn't want to marry you know, this suitor, and she was martyred. But it's also related to the term for light, 
also relate to Lucifer. So you have the dark forces and the light forces. But when you add the saffron, you have these luminous buns on the darkest day of the year, and they're very delicious. So I talked about the Vikings, and the other people who were living there were the Sami, whom I've also mentioned, the reindeer herders. And uh, the Europeans who were living in Scandinavia were intrigued by the Sami because they were so different. They spoke a different language, they looked different, they lived differently. And in 1673, a scholar at Uppsala University in Sweden um, wrote a book about Lapland, Laponia, uh, Johannes Schefferus, and you can see that he talks about uh, the region, and he says, on the origin, superstitions, and sacred magic of the Sami, or the Laplanders. The reason I want to show you this cover is uh, because of the importance of this idea of superstition and sacred magic. Well into the 18th century, when you had Linnaeus, Carl Linnaeus, who is the father of taxonomy and the binomial uh, system of naming things, well, he was aware of all of the dark magic around him. And one of his missions was to try to overcome that. He said, without science, demons of the forest would hide in every bush. Spectres would haunt every dark corner. Imps, gnomes, river spirits, and the others in Lucifer's gang would live among us like gray cats. And superstition, witchcraft, and black magic would swarm around us like mosquitoes. And of course, everyone's familiar with mosquitoes there. And so uh, his great-grandmother was actually burned at the stake. So I think he felt as a witch. So I think he felt it very deeply. But he went to the north of Sweden and found that the people were so poor that they were uh, pulling the bark off trees and eating that. And he was very distressed, uh, not just at the poverty, but because the trees were important to the economy. And so he advocated that they eat bog myrtle, nettles, and lichen. Um, in place of the bark of trees. And here you can see the nettle. Nettle is very much like spinach, rich in vitamin A um, and vitamin C. And it uh, here you can see that it has the Linnaean name, Ortica, uh, what is it, Dioica, L, the L standing for Linnaeus. And um, you can gather these, they sting, so you have to wear gloves, but once you cook them, you can make beautiful soups. They also dried it and baked it into bread, so it's very nourishing. The lichen that he advocated, the reindeer lichen, I think is somewhat less um, delicious than nettle, which is a really beautiful herbal food. I had this lichen dish at Noma. Uh, the Noma, which is soon to be no more in Copenhagen, but it's where all of the new Nordic uh, revolution began. Uh, René Redzepi, the chef, is, is quite brilliant in what he has done with the foods that people have been eating forever. They're actually very traditional foods, but he recreates them in new ways. And what you have here is reindeer lichen that has been flash fried for, I think, no more than about five seconds because you don't want it to absorb any oil. You just want it to get a little bit crisp. And then he's taken mushrooms, uh, the porcini, dried them, and then powdered it. And then, of course, his presentation is always gorgeous, uh, serving it on a bed of moss. So the Sami would eat the reindeer lichen uh, that they would harvest for free. At Noma, you pay quite a bit more for that uh, little dish of reindeer lichen. The other thing that's very important in the Nordic countries is dairying. And what I found extraordinary in doing my research is that 90% of the Swedish population is lactose tolerant. It's kind of unheard of because most of uh, humans are actually uh, able to imbibe mother's milk, but then uh, lactose intolerance grows as we age. And many people in the population just can't digest it. But the Swedes do, and it, it's pretty amazing. And so there's a whole tradition of dairying. 
On the um, upper right, you see my favorite cheese from Sweden. It's called Vesterbotten. And you lucky people in the Bay Area can go right up to Nordic House on San Pablo in Berkeley, and they sell it. And I urge all of you to taste it. It's a very sharp, almost Parmesan-like cheese, and it's really beautiful. Beneath it, you find it's sort of, um, Oh, Nordic House on San Pablo. And they also have the salted herring, and they, um, I hope, will carry my book. Are you working on that, Erin? I could, OK. <laughs> um, it, it's sort of polar opposite is beneath it. It's called uh, Brunost, or Jetost, and it's Norwegian. And it's made from the whey of goat's milk, usually, that is mixed with milk or cream and then boiled down until it's caramelized and really soft. It's almost like fudge, and it becomes very sweet. And you take a cheese plane, and you shave it, and you put it on a cracker like that. And the, it's the Norwegian national cheese, and uh, people absolutely love it. I tend to like the firm cheeses that have a more piquant flavor. But a cheese I discovered in researching this book, which is now one of my new favorites, is the other one. And that's known as bread cheese or squeaky cheese. It's called bread cheese because the curds are formed into a loaf. They're pressed, and then they're baked in the oven. And you can see that little bit of uh, you know, caramelized, the Maillard reaction that causes those nice brown spots. Called squeaky cheese because, um, like some other cheeses you've had, sometimes mozzarella, when you chew it, you get a sort of squeaking sensation. But the fascinating thing is that in the far north of Sweden, well, starting in Finland, Sweden, and Norway, one way that they eat it is by dropping it into a cup, pouring coffee over it, as you see here. And you drink the coffee, and it doesn't taste like cheese, believe me. Um, but you can, I don't know how well the sort of globules of, of fat show up there, but it gives it a kind of body, as milk does. You know, we put milk in coffee, so why not put cheese in coffee? I mean, really, what's the difference? But then you finish the cup of coffee, and at the bottom is this wonderful cheese that actually has a slight coffee flavor. And it, it's a really cool thing to do. So in Sweden, they talk about SOS. You know, for us, it's like, help. And in Sweden, it's also help. It's help. I need something to eat. And what do I need? I need the smur, which is, do you remember? Butter, Butter yes. Ost, which is the cheese, and sill which is the uh, herring. But of course, my friends say it's not the, the uh, butter, cheese, and herring. It's the other word that starts with S, which is the schnapps. So you have to, you can understand SOS in many ways, but you have to eat quickly, and preferably with the schnapps. And the schnapps, which is the aquavit, uh, is so important to Swedish culture, but also to other cultures. That way back in 1922, when there was threat of prohibition, this, uh, there was a campaign against prohibition. So this poster by Alfred Engström is not saying no to alcohol, which is what you would think looking at it. It's saying no to no to alcohol because crayfish need this drink. <laughs> so what's that all about? Well, crayfish are an institution, particularly in Finland and Sweden. And every year, and it used to be an exact day, it's just that has changed now. But the end of July, beginning of August, is crayfish season. And when you eat crayfish, you have to have schnapps. You can have beer, too, but one you, the crayfish would die without the schnapps to accompany them, basically. And um, unfortunately, they were overfished, you know, as happens all over the world. And in the early 20th century, they um, got a fungus. And so uh, many of the crayfish disappeared. In the 1960s, they started importing crayfish from the United States, the signal crayfish. And it also became infected with this fungus. And so now the noble crayfish, as they call it, is very expensive, um, but still the preferred one to eat. And there are wonderful crayfish parties every August. 
But if you're talking about an entry food, like the gateway food into Scandinavia, it would be gravlax, which I'm sure all of you have tasted. It's cured salmon. And it comes from a very ancient method. Uh, the word is an abbreviation of gravid lox, which means buried salmon. And the fishermen would go fishing, and then they would take the salmon and bury it in the sand until they had finished all of their expedition. And so it started to ferment slightly. Now we don't bury it in the sand. We just rub it with a mixture of sugar and salt. Uh, and pepper, you can flavor with elderflower, you can flavor with juniper or, or uh, you know, uh, fennel or whatever you want. Put some dill between it and leave it for two to three days in the refrigerator and it's really, really beautiful. But all of these Nordic foods are based on preservation and trying to get through the winter. Here you see the gravlax with crisp bread, which again is a way of preserving bread because it's a cracker, it's dry, it'll last forever. And a beet tartare, which granted is a, a much more modern iteration of uh, cooked beets, but they are very sweet, they have a lot of sugar in them, but they're mixed with uh, gherkins or you know uh, dill pickles and some vinegar, so they have a sweet and sour flavor, which is one of the hallmarks of Nordic taste, particularly in Denmark and the south of Sweden. Surströmming, which is uh, fermentation taken to uh, what some would consider an Anthony Bourdain level, uh, is herring that has been allowed to ferment and some people would say go bad. The smell is, have any of you ever experienced it? It's extremely strong. It's actually been banned by the EU on airlines unless the flight originates in Sweden. If you look at the top picture, you see that the can is bulging. I mean, I was brought up never to buy a bulging can because you know, it'll be botulism. But this is desirable. Salt was not uh, very prevalent in the Nordic lands. It was very expensive. So what they did to preserve the herring, and this is Baltic herring, was to put it in a very lightly salted brine instead of a strong salt. And then it, it would ferment and uh, really begin to rot by many people's terms. And then it's put into a can where it continues to ferment. And then in August, just like with the crayfish season, it's the surf trimming season. You open it outdoors, underwater, and uh, either you like it or you do not. But it's, um, they do this uh, in Norway. They have rockefisk. In Iceland, they have hakkerl, which is the fermented shark. So it's really one of the things I love to think about is just the difference between uh, what is fresh and what is preserved. So Magnus Nilsson came here and spoke at Google in 2012. And I captured this slide from his uh, YouTube video, Food at Google, uh, when he was talking about his restaurant, Faviken and uh, the seasons. And it's really very telling because you can see that the season for fresh foods is so fleeting for the garden, for the cultivated foods. The vegetables are extraordinary because of course you have 24 hours of daylight in much of the north. And so they get this intense flavor that even though I have summertime in Massachusetts, which I actually do have, but we don't have 24 hours of daylight. Our vegetables never get this flavorsome. But look how much is um, foraged, so usually in late spring and late summer to early f fall, and then the green line and how much is stored and preserved. So it's really, really important to think not just about preserving these things, but also the transformation of flavor. So you start by doing something to survive, but then the flavor becomes something different and intense and uh, very beautiful to me. Uh, when we think of pickles, we think of vinegar. In Scandinavia, more often they're brine, so they're put again in a salt solution, which gives them just a, a, it's not a vinegary flavor. You get the more essential flavor of the cucumbers especially when you add the dill. They also make pickles using vinegar. Uh, these are pickled beets. In Sweden, the vinegar ranges from 12 to 
In the United States, it's generally 5% um, of the um, acetic acid. And sometimes you can get 7%. The 24% stuff is uh, also used as a cleaning product. <laughs> and it's not legal in the United States. I tried so hard to find it because I wanted to make the authentic you know, pickled beets. I could not find it. But um, their general proportion, it's called the 1, 2, 3 solution. So it's one part vinegar, two parts sugar. So you get the sweet and sour thing going, and then three parts water. And that I had to adjust because our vinegar is not nearly as strong. And of course, pickled herring, which starts with the salted herring that has already been preserved. And then it, the salt is rinsed off, and you put it into a sweet and sour vinegar solution. There's um, another important method of preservation that I haven't mentioned yet, and that's drying, which is practiced mainly in Norway. And cod was so important uh, for the whole economy of Norway until they discovered oil. And Norway, which was once the uh, most poor country in Scandinavia, is now the wealthiest, so the tables have been turned. But they take the scray, which live in the Barents Sea. They live there for five years, and then they come down the west coast to spawn in the Lufetan Islands. And they're hung in the air to dry. So you have the salt air from the sea that dries them. You don't have to add additional salt. And it became known as stockfish, but they also have others that they dry on the rocks. And this was the lifeblood. This was the uh, essence of the fishing culture. By now, it has largely died out. And you see these same racks that are standing empty. And they have built roads out to the islands. And now you know it's a vacation site. And people come, and they gaze at them. And it's really beautiful. And the fish themselves are endangered, because Russia and Norway signed a treaty about the Barents Sea. And now it will be open to exploration for oil and natural gas, and it's the world's last uh, large stock of wild cod. So it is a cause for concern. Uh, I wanted to show you the final um, method of preservation, and that, of course, is smoking. So all of these things transform flavors. They add another layer of flavor. And uh, they also, even though it's all very chic now, it goes back to survival. And so returning to this theme of fire and ice, I think of the Sami huts, which you can uh, visit as tourists <laughs> if you go to the north of Sweden or to Finland. It's called a kota. And here you have this hut. And in the center, you have the hearth. And the smoke goes out the, the central chimney. And you can see the salmon on a plank that is um, being cooked by the uh, indirect uh, flames from the fire. You find that in the Pacific Northwest, you know, the planked salmon that the Native Americans did. They put them on cedar planks. In Finland, this is known as fire glow salmon. And it's really beautiful. It, it's very succulent and moist. But uh, the thing that I also think about with this slide is um, the word focus, which is the Latin word for hearth. So the hearth. The, the center of the home really is the focus. And fire is all about warmth and cooking and conviviality. And to me, ice is too. Because uh, you can have a bar with the schnapps. The, you know, this is the ultimate icebreaker in the, uh, the north of Sweden, right on the Russian border. And so ice can be warming too, and this wonderful antidote to the darkness. Thank you. And now, if you have any questions, I don't know if there's any time. Oh, yeah. yeah. There are a few minutes left for questions. I'm happy to answer any. So much of the Nordic cooking seems to be about place and a representation of the environment and what's right there in their backyard. Um, and I think you touched a lot about on this a little bit, but can you talk about what it was like developing recipes and maybe some of the challenges that you ran into creating that sense of place in an American kitchen. I was very pleased. It was quite easy. 
uh, living in Massachusetts, which is a northerly place. But I think that uh, for the most part, all of the recipes can be created anywhere because the only ingredients that were difficult to find were fresh herring, which runs only in uh, June in the East Coast. Here you have yours coming up. There's amazing herring in the San Francisco Bay. And you'll be able to get it if you can find a fishmonger who will sell it to you. And it's an extraordinary fish. It's, most of the herring in this country goes to Japan for sushi, where they appreciate it, or is ground into cat food, because cats appreciate it too. But it's an amazing fish. White fish is also eaten a lot. We have great white fish in the Great Lakes. And again, it's not a fish that people tend to think about. And uh, Swedish anchovies, which you can buy up the road, you know, or you can even buy them on Amazon. They're not the same as the salted Italian anchovies. They are um, sprats that have been cured in a, a sweet and sour brine with some sandalwood and spices. And they're added to wonderful dishes like Janssen's Temptation, which is basically creamed potatoes with um, these uh, fish that just melt in, oh, I'm starting to salivate again, these fish that just melt into it. It's really wonderful. So I found it, as opposed to the Georgian cookbook that I wrote, when I moved to the Berkshires, I couldn't even find cilantro. That was way back in the dark ages, but I would have to travel for an hour to buy some cilantro. These ingredients are for the most part familiar to us. Um, the fresh mushrooms you can either forage or you have you know, the, the fairy market here <laughs> that I'm so envious of, or the Berkeley Bowl, or any of these places that have lots of mushrooms. Lingonberries, cloudberries, you can't get them fresh. How'd you, how did you decide which recipes to put in the book? I wanted some that were iconic, so obviously Gravlax had to be in there. I didn't put lutefisk in, which is the uh, dried uh, cod that is treated with lye and then reconstituted that Garrison Keillor has made so many jokes about. Uh, so I decided to put in ones that I enjoy eating, but also some that people might know about and that really did speak of place. One of uh, the more unusual ones in the book is for one of the first foods I tasted in Finland. It's called vispipuro, which simply means whipped pudding. And what you do is you take uh, farina, which is basically cream of wheat, but not the instant stuff. It has to be the so-called slow cooking, which I think is only 10 minutes. But for Americans, that's impossible, you know. But don't try with instant. And you just cook the, the farina. And when it, uh, with cranberry juice, there they would use lingonberry juice, but here I substitute cranberry juice. It turns this beautiful garnet color. And then you put it into the mixer and you whip it. And it's this gorgeous pudding. And no one knows what's in it because who would think of eating a cold cream of wheat, you know, lurid pink pudding. <laughs> and it's absolutely delicious. It's an after school treat for children. It's very nourishing. So I wanted that to be in there. They use a lot of almond paste, which I adore. So that was a reflection of me. So there's a beautiful wreath uh, of um, a, a, a rich brioche-like bread that has almond paste in it. Uh, they grind up almonds and make meringue layers and then spread strawberries and whipped cream during the summer. There are a lot of soups because soup is uh, slow cooked and nourishing. Um, I could go on and on. So much of it uh, reflected me, my own taste, what I thought Americans would be interested in, but also trying to get somewhat of a balance between these four countries. And I think, uh, you know, I didn't add them up because I'm not a, a Google person. <laughs> so I, I didn't look at them quantitatively. But uh, in general, I, I think it's pretty well balanced. OK, well, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>